Okay, good morning, everybody. I'm Mike Falk, I'll be your host today. Uh, thanks for joining, we appreciate it. Uh, our guest for today is Mr. David Jolly, and he needs very little introduction. Is that to me, Mike? That's for you, David. Can All you right, well, 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 thank you, and thank you to the Democratic Club of the Villages for having me this morning. I apologize for, for my part in this going virtual, but as Chris and I stayed in touch, it's for what I believe is a very good reason. My wife and I have two children under the age of three, and we are spending most of the summer in the mountains of Pennsylvania. You can see them behind me. And for reasons of public health and public health responsibility with two young children unvaccinated, um, we just decided that it, the, the appropriate decision uh, would not be to appear in person, even though my wife and I are proudly vaccinated, uh, given the science that we could possibly still transmit to our children. I think each of you understand, uh, hopefully, that we made the right decision. So I apologize to not be with you in person. I know we tried this last year, just at the start of the pandemic. And as Chris and I have communicated, one of these days, I want to get out there in person to visit with each of you uh, when things have settled down and be with the Democratic Club of the Villages in person, because I kind of see the, uh, the Democratic Club of the Villages almost as a bulwark, uh, if you will, against the red tie that is moving through Florida right now. And, you know, I'll, I'll make a couple of opening comments. Uh, Mike and Chris were, were kind enough to aggregate some questions from the from the group that I'll, in the interest of just a seamless virtual experience, will also kind of just tick through in my opening comments. But I always think the greatest value is in a little bit of give and take. And so I do want to get to kind of live questions and answers as soon as possible. Um, but, but let's go to public policy making in the state of Florida and, and why my wife and I don't feel comfortable uh, having our children in, in the public health environment that is Florida today. And it's because of the policies of our governor and the Republican legislature that enables him and affirms him and passes and supports and defends the policies that he is actually out there implementing in the state. And when it comes to public health, I will tell you that I think the state of Florida is more dangerous today because of the leadership or lack of, of Ron DeSantis. And I don't know what is worse, that he is ignoring the public health science and putting children at risk, or he's missing an action. And this is something that's not really focused on, but consider that this is a governor that has held fundraisers now in four different states around the country, all while the, the pandemic is wreaking havoc in the state of Florida. He's down at the Southern border trying to solve Governor Abbott's problems in Texas, using the guardsmen and women from the state of Florida for political purposes down at the Southern border raising money from conservative organizations, going around the state when he's in Florida, handing out checks that are a result of stimulus money that not a single Republican supported in Washington. We are less safe in the state of Florida because of the policies of Ron DeSantis. I don't say that to, with hyperbole. I don't say that to be a cheap shot. Just follow the data, follow the, the political behavior in our state. And, and the opportunity missed if I could put it in more generous terms, is this. The governor currently has pitted the, the very fundamental American value of personal freedom. He has gone all in with personal freedom, but he has pitted it against the equally important value of patriotism, of doing for your country, of doing for your neighbor, of doing the things that make for a good citizen, which is if if you can get vaccinated, get vaccinated. And if you cannot, then engage in appropriate public health behaviors through distancing, through self-isolation or through mask wearing. It is not hard to present to the voters, to all of us, to the American culture, that there could be a balancing test in this moment between protecting personal freedom and also encouraging the patriotism of responding to something greater than yourself. Voters understand that. Voters understand that there are no easy answers sometimes in tough situations. We're in a tough situation. Our country's had a sucker punch to the gut as a result of the pandemic and also the events of January 6th were fractured politically. It would not be hard to deliver a message that balances some of the concerns of both sides of this debate while also promoting public health. That's the opportunity missed. That's the most generous 
I could present it. But the most damning is that this is a governor who doesn't care about the health of children in the state of Florida. And that's why we're not with you today, because I don't believe Ron DeSantis cares about the health of children in the state of Florida. And if our kids were school age, I re recognizing my wife and I uh, have created opportunities for ourselves that allow us to make decisions that not every family has. But if our kids were school age, I would not send them to school in the state of Florida right now. Now, it's not to say I wouldn't be in the state of Florida, but I would not send them to a state of Florida school right now, given the current rules and given the current behaviors that are protected by not just Ron DeSantis, but as I mentioned, the legislature, the Department of Education, Richard Corcoran, the, the chair of the education department there as well. I want to I want to take that conversation as it relates kind of to, to schools, to kids, to public health policy. And I wanna to pivot to something. My, my comments, as you can hear, are, are somewhat impassioned. Um, and I think everybody is feeling somewhat impassioned right now. I don't think I'm unique in the level of concern, but I wanna offer something for Democrats writ large in Florida to consider. You know, I, I appear on NBC, MSNBC often I am in political conversations often, and the, and the question always comes up, how can Democrats win statewide? I'm not a Democrat. I'm a registered NPA. I'm not a Republican. So what I will share with you is not to suggest that I know best what Democrats should do. Democrats have some tough decisions to make in primaries and otherwise. But what I can share with you is a perspective as a former Republican and to know how Republicans sometimes play politics that Democrats don't. And what I would encourage leading Democrats who are running statewide and within the state to consider is this. You don't get to affect public policy in the state of Florida if you don't win. And sometimes winning takes thinking methodically about how you approach the issues that are most important to the people of Florida and to ensure that you're speaking to issues on which you can win. I would suggest where we sit today barring continued fundamental mismanagement that creates a legitimate national crisis from which Ron DeSantis cannot emerge as it relates to COVID. But let's say, take a timestamp today. If the election were tomorrow, mismanagement of the COVID pandemic may not be the issue that Democrats wanna run on. And the reason is because you're playing on the governor's field when you do that, right? And the governor has, has staked out this very passionate position on the right and for Republican leaning voters that he is defending your freedom. He is helping you keep your job. He's helping keeping the economy alive. He's help, helping keeping schools open and, and businesses open and restaurants open. That resonates, right? And it, particularly in a dispassionate vacuum, that message is actually what we want any of our uh, elected officials to do, Republicans or Democrats, keep things open, keep the economy good, keep schools going, keep people in schools he's able to frame it as a matter of personal freedom. Democrats, if they just focus on the mismanagement of the pandemic, I think we're playing to a tie a little bit. What I would suggest is pull the governor and pull leading Republicans in the state of Florida to a different playing field. Pull them to your playing field, pull them to the democratic playing field. And here's a good example. Let's stay with education. Ron DeSantis has been going around the state handing out thousand dollar checks to teachers and first responders. God bless teachers and first responders. I don't think anybody would suggest that they shouldn't be paid more, but understand where Democrats could frame this. Not just that Ron DeSantis is being disingenuous and using democratically approved stimulus money to hand out checks in the state of Florida under his imprint, if not his own personal signature, but it's this. If Ron DeSantis really cares about education and paying teachers more, why doesn't he have an education budget that actually forecasts for the next five years an increase in, in salaries for teachers and first responders in a significant way? Why is Florida not the leading state in education, not just in the country, but a destination worldwide for public education? Why have we not taken stimulus money and created virtual classroom opportunities that lead the world in technology that can better equip and better train our students, can better reward teachers for the jobs they continue to do? Why are we abandoning public education and the outcome in our schools? Ron DeSantis wants to run on the pandemic. He wants to run on the economy. Why don't we run on the fact that he's a failure when it comes to education? If we are on issues 
on our playing field that are true, that he cannot defend himself on. Consider that the opportunity to change a kid's life happens every single morning when they walk through a public school. Parents know that. Parents worry that their kids aren't getting the best education. And parents who have chosen and have the means to take their kids out of public school and put them in private, many of them resent having to pay private school tuition if it's the church school down the street or whatever it might be. They resent it because they think, they believe we should have the best public education system in the world, but we don't. So rather than the cheap exercise of using democratic stimulus money to hand out thousand dollar checks, why don't you invest in teacher salaries for the next five to 10 years? Why don't you invest in infrastructure and technology in public schools for the next five to 10 years? Why don't you make public education in the state of Florida the best in the world? Now we have the governor and Republicans on the defensive. Doing that, I will tell you as, a, as someone with 25 years in, in campaigns and, and some myself, doing that requires a long lead time. Right, You need voters to think when they get to the voting booth, wait a minute, why, why is our education system not what it could be in the state of Florida? You can't do that overnight. You can't do that in the last two weeks of a campaign. You have to decide what are the issues that we want to make Republicans and Ron DeSantis defend themselves upon and then run that race for a year, frame that race. Elections are decided based on the contrast of, of two candidates. And from your very low information voters to your very high information voters, it all comes down to a contrast. You see two candidates. I'm an independent. I wish you saw three. <laughs> but you see two candidates and you're voting based on a contrast. Which one, A or B? The, the way the issues are framed going into that election define that contrast for voters. And I think Democrats have an opportunity in this environment, starting early, coming off of an election where I know Democrats have been disappointed in the past, losing some close statewide races. It's not about trying to be Republican light. It's not about trying to, to steal Republican talking points. It's about rethinking the Democratic agenda and framing it in a way that voters respond to. Take voters' rights, uh, the voter protection agenda of largely the Democratic Party, the voter suppression agenda of the Republican Party. I was on with uh, Nicole Wallace and Heilman this week, and I used the example in Texas. I said, look, Texas Republicans have framed the debate and Democrats are responding to it saying, no, 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 you can't do this. Well, take an example. Texas Republicans have said the, the county around Houston, the third largest county in the, in the nation, used 24-hour voting during the pandemic. And so the state legislature, Republicans, said, oh, we can't have 24-hour voting because it can't be secured. So that was outlawed in the Senate bill. Democrats are arguing you're depressing turnout, which is true. But again, that's a situation where you're playing a bit to a tie, right? You're speaking to your own audiences on the right and on the left. Suppose Texas Democrats said, we want the most secure elections in the country. And because of that, we want to keep 24-hour voting but we want to make sure it's secure. Lead with an agenda that says, we are going to lead in voter security in the state of Texas. We are going to invest additional resources in security, whatever that means, whatever that looks like, but don't accept how Republicans have framed it. Frame it yourself and then go out and beat Republicans <laughs> next November. I say that as an independent having left the Republican party because I do believe that what the Republican party has become today is dangerous for American culture. I, I say this with lament. Some of you may have seen it on, on TV this week, depending on the programming you follow. I fear, given the state of the Republican Party, the willingness of the Republican Party to support conspiracy, uh, to look the other way at hostility, I fear that there could be additional incidents of violence done in the name of political motivation. And, and I really do mean that. Any of you who saw the video of the school board in Tennessee that was considering masking requirements and the verbal and near physical assault of doctors and nurses that continued into the parking lot that required the protection of law enforcement. We're just one step away from a, from a very dangerous, unfortunate incident. And in large part, because those behaviors are being condoned and in some cases affirmed by leading Republicans across the country today. There are many reasons I'm no longer a leading Republican, but one of them is I do believe 
that they are creating a dangerous environment in our, in our culture. And I believe their politics are focused on a growing minority of voters in the country. They have hit a ceiling of voters based on their policies and behavior. And now all they have left is rigging the rules to help protect a growing minority of Republican voters. You can look at the presidential election. I believe it's now one out of the last seven or eight presidential elections, only one have the, Demo have the Republicans won the national popular vote. That was in 04 and Bush 43's reelection. The Republicans are in trouble. And so they're engaging in dangerous behavior and in undemocratic behavior as well. A bit of an impassioned uh, rant, maybe this Saturday morning. Um, hopefully it addresses some of, some of your thoughts, some of your concerns. I do want to get to, I, I thought what I would do is the list that, that was provided of questions, um, I thought I would just kind of do a bit of a lightning round just for reasons of being responsive to, uh, to the questions, but also maybe then it just tees up further conversation for some give and take here this morning. So with that, um, the first question that, that came in came in from Mike, and the question was, why are Republican legislatures across the state or across the country engaging in voter suppression tactics? And it's very much because of what I just said. The numbers are moving against Republicans in so many jurisdictions. Texas is trending more blue. Georgia is trending blue. Virginia is virtually all blue now. Not only is that reflected in the popular vote for president, but there are now state houses, control of state houses that are on the line and understand why that's critically important. <clears throat> it's not just about the electoral college. It's not just about, um, about control of the state legislature. It's about control of districting seats for Congress as well. In 94, when Newt Gingrich and the Republicans emerged to control the Congress, Gingrich said, look, not only are we gonna control the Congress, but we're gonna move in to control state houses as well so we can redraw lines. Understand what happened. They used the rules of gerrymandering and they took a state like Georgia, which in 1994 had, I believe, three Republicans and eight Democrats. And two years later, flipped it to eight Republicans and three Democrats. Same voting universe in the state of Florida, in Georgia. No real, uh, no real voter registration changes. They just used the rules and the control of the state house to control how districts were drawn for Congress to try to create this more competitive majority for Republicans nationally. That is the only reason they are doing this. And I, I shared recently Fighting back against voter suppression laws is rooted in very constitutional voting rights, civil rights uh, convictions, and it should be. This is a civil rights moment. This is a voting rights moment, nearly akin to the 60s, though a very different environment then. So I'm careful making the analogy, but I think it has to be defined as a civil rights, as a voting rights moment right now in 2021. But even if Democrats don't want to have the fight on constitutional grounds, have it on partisan grounds. Because whoever wins this fight is going to be able to control elections and create majorities for a generation to come. That's why Republicans are doing this. On the infrastructure package, a question came in, why did McConnell finally cave? And here's what I would, would offer for you to consider. Infrastructure packages move through Congress every five or six years. They have to. Congress has to reauthorize funding for roads and bridges and tunnels and seaports and airports. They have kicked the can down the road the past few years and been unable to get anything done, largely because Donald Trump and his governing behavior or lack of governing behavior really stood in the way of that. Um, but what just passed the Senate, what McConnell and 19 Republicans agreed to is nothing extraordinary. It will be sold as extraordinary, but it really is routine governing that, frankly, we haven't seen routine <laughs> governing. So in many ways, I suppose that's a win. It's a return to normalcy. But the big prize, the big package is what Biden and the Democrats want to do with this second human infrastructure package. That's where Biden's agenda really sits on a bit of a fulcrum. And I, I would say don't expect any Republican votes at all for that. That has to get done exclusively, exclusively with Democrats. Uh, another question, do I support restoring felon voting rights? 100%, absolutely. Uh, COVID mitigation, do you favor Man, a mandate in all schools, do you favor vaccination mandates, mask wearing, and so forth? The answer is yes. I do believe that vaccination should be required for schools. Here is 
an approach that you have not heard discussed that I do think is important. And when I mentioned needing additional investments in, uh, in virtual learning, making the classroom in Florida the leading classroom in the world, I do believe prudence could suggest that until the vaccine is FDA approved for children, that we do need a virtual platform for students to continue this, this school year. We would all like the timeline to be different, right? FDA, final FDA approval for adults should happen sometime this month. It's widely expected by Labor Day. Is that sufficient grounds to say we are going to mandate vaccinations in our schools? I, I do wonder, you know, every other vaccination that is required when we talk about all these vaccinations being required for schools, they are all approved. And so I do think there could be a combination of virtual in person like we saw last year or even virtual until a vaccine has been finally approved for children. But I think we have to consider whether or not approval is required before we mandate it. That does not mean we can't protect our kids. I mean, we could go to, to virtual, we could go to every other day. None of this is convenient for parents. None of it is, is the best environment for students, but nothing's more important than the health of, of students and teachers. Uh, question, what is one thing the Democratic Party should be doing that would improve their chances to keep the House and Senate in 2022? This is, look, this is, this is a big question for Democrats because, and, and this is, I think every Democrat might answer this a little differently. Democrats should assume you only have two years of control of the House, Senate, and the White House. History would suggest the odds are you probably have two years. But history has also not seen a chapter like this in the minority party, in the Republican Party that's continuing to fracture. The choice for Democrats is do you go big? Do you go big with a progressive agenda? And in some ways, I think you could make the case, and I don't mean this is the pejorative that Republicans do, that the Biden administration has been the most progressive administration since FDR. You could make that case. If you think that is the politics of the moment, that, that you need bold, big ideological leadership, then you got to go all in on that. Or if you think it is a return to, to more sensible, moderate governing bipartisanship, you got to choose one message or the other. The way House seats are drawn, unfortunately, reward more partisanship rather than less. So for simply controlling the House, I think going big probably works better than, uh, than trying to toe the line. Question on, <laughs> and, and we're almost in the end, two or three questions here, and then, and then I want to open it up. Uh, I laugh because the next question is on critical race theory, a conversation a lot of people <laughs> try to avoid on TV. Uh, I don't try to avoid it. I, I would tell you this. I think the most important thing schools can do is teach students to think critically. And that includes providing them authentic, honest storytelling about our history, about the influence of racism, the fact that our nation was founded uh, recognizing slavery, eventually recognizing that that people of color were only three-fifths of a person, recognizing that it took us nearly 200 years to get to a point where we passed landmark civil rights legislation in the 1960s, 200 years away from 1789. Racism has affected ladders of opportunity. It has affected wealth gaps, economic gaps, education gaps. You see it in our socio-demographic data today. There's nothing wrong with presenting that information to students. And nothing about critical race theory needs to impose upon students what to do with that information. But being honest about our history is probably the best way we can empower students to begin to think critically about what it means for the United States and where we are today. Uh, another question, what do you believe are of equal, what issues are of equal interest to both parties? Very simply, keeping a, a domestic economic security platform that resonates with the American people, as well as a national security platform that keeps the nation safe. We all know throughout history, Americans, all populations, but the American political culture thrives when the domestic economy is strong and when the world is at peace. Those are very simple concepts, but there are very small decisions that can impact them. The pandemic provides a good example, how you balance uh, a domestic economy in peril. Decisions of each president implicate our national security as well. Those are all, all measurable. Uh, 
I often, my wife often tells me that when I was a candidate, uh, you get too far in the weeds. You're too much of a policy wonk. Look at successful candidates, some of them in the state of Florida, some of them running right now. They don't get in the weeds. They tell you, hey, we're going to protect the economy in the state of Florida, keep people safe, keep our schools safe. And that resonates with the majority of voters. And the last question, um, how can the Dems reach the Cuban community re regarding the dictatorial approach of DeSantis and how can they hate Castro but love DeSantis? This question is fascinating and it's a fascinating opportunity for Democrats. You know, something that intrigued me when Nick, uh, when Nikki Fried announced her candidacy, her very opening pitch, I think it was on her opening video, she said, I'm a capitalist. And then she said it in Spanish, going for that Cuban American demographic. Start with what I, I led with this morning because this question is a perfect end cap to it. Ron DeSantis and Republicans are framing their agenda with the Cuban American community as protecting freedom. But suppose you flip that script on them and make them defend their policies, make them defend how what they're doing is actually keeping our economy strong and our, our school safe and our community safe. Because if you can do that, if you can show that we have a governor who is willing to use the heavy hand of the state to override local decisions in Miami-Dade County, in the county where, where the Cuban Americans uh, most densely reside, if you can demonstrate that the, the governing behaviors of the governor are similar to the country in which they, they lost, boy, you've reframed this debate and you've brought Republicans over to the Democratic playing field and perhaps you got a shot at the Cuban American community. So I uh, thank you very much for letting me be with you this morning, even virtually. Thank you for spending some time this morning uh, as well. I know everybody's got Saturday plans, but uh, Mike, thank you. And I'll throw it back to you to, to moderate any questions uh, that might come. Paul oh, Marshall wants to ask a question. Uh, first of all, it's so good to see you, if not in person, at <laughs> least more personally than I normally see you, which is every day on television. <laughs> right. This is gonna seem like a very odd question, but I have a feeling that it has probably occurred to more people than just me. Would you consider working as a consultant to the Florida Democratic Party? <laughs> but, so just, to, just to add to that, I think we spend so much time talking to ourselves, reinforcing what each one of us is saying, yeah. that we're not hearing the kind of ideas that within what, 20 minutes you presented this morning. Yeah. Uh, when we talk about critical thinking <laughs> in terms of public schools and kids, uh, it applies to adults as well. And I don't know that we're doing such a hot shot job of it. Uh, yeah. But I, I'm just asking the question, would you <laughs> consider being a consultant to the Florida Democratic <laughs> Party? Because frankly, you would be the best. Ex <laughs> you just looked at your wife, I think. <laughs> No, 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 I didn't. I heard some some water running. I want to make sure oh. it wasn't raining. <laughs> but, um, I, I think it would be phenomenal. So well, just off the top of your head. That's that's very kind. The answer is is certainly yes, because I, I, I do believe for the good of the state, for the good of the country, we have to defeat Republicans at the ballot box. I don't say that embittered that, that it was a party I was with for 30 years and I've now left. I, I just really mean it. You know, I, I said on TV one time, our daughter had just been born or was about to be born. And I was sitting at the desk with Brian Williams. And the question was all things Trump, as most of the news was during his presidency. And I said, Brian, I, I just want to present something in a totally different way. I hope Donald Trump loses election because I don't want my daughter growing up learning that he, he is president. I, I don't want my daughter to come of age in an environment in which his leadership, his, his tone, his message is one that she begins to learn at an early age. And I mean that almost from a cultural perspective, we've got to extract Republican, this generation of Republicans out of governing. The answer is yes, I'd be happy to, to support Democrats. Um, I would tell you culturally the interesting thing, some of you might, <laughs> might respond to this. Um, a lot of people say, hey, Jolly, would you even consider running as a Democrat, or people say, hey, you should get back into elected office. 
as a lot of people who watch MSNBC, some of them hate me, some of them like me, whatever it is, but they say, hey, I love you on TV. You should run again. And I say, yeah, but you wouldn't vote for me. And they say, oh, no, 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 I'm a Democrat. I'm not going to vote for an independent. <laughs> so what I would also say is culturally within the both parties, um, I don't think the culture of party leadership and of party structures is interested in bringing a former Republican over, bringing an independent over, uh, simply because, you know, each side thinks they, they've got all the answers. And, and here's what I would also say that's important. <clears throat> Democrats are right on the edge. You know, we look at the, the Republican wins in the state, but we all know that the, these are two point races, one point races. And I think it's natural. It's intuitive to respond to the events in front of us and say, boy, this is an awful public health environment or boy, these policies are bad. And if that's our natural posture, that's fine. That's our human reaction. But people don't respond to that. That's not, that's not motivating. That's not aspirational political leadership. Aspirational political leadership is, I'm going to make the Florida school system the best public school system in the world. Come with me. If you get Floridians believing in an aspirational agenda, aspirational agenda, not Republicans are bad. Right, you'll, right. Well, you'll never get over the 50% <clears throat> line with that. But an aspirational agenda the, the tone, the narrative, the messaging you heard when Obama first emerged, we believed that we could be one America. That's the messaging. And, and I, look, and I think leading Democratic candidates know that it's just so easy to fall back into the trap of just Republicans are bad. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, Rick, can you unmute Shirley? <laughs> Hi, David. Thanks for coming today. Enjoy Pennsylvania. I'm a Pennsylvanian. <laughs> oh, um, good, good. Uh, so I, I'm, we've been doing this for five years, listening to this crazy man. And I, 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 one of my questions is, why do people keep voting that way? Why did they vote? Why did 74 million people vote for that crazy man, number one? And number two, it seems like people keep voting for, for people that hurt them. Yeah. Why, so, why is that? So, so let's start with a premise. Um, that is true. Washington does not do a good job of governing. And it's in large part for a principle that is true in business, in organizational science, and in government. There is an inefficiency <clears throat> that comes with collective decision making, right? Any body, any board, any legislative, any parent teacher or association, whatever it might be, collective decision making is naturally inefficient. And so nothing gets done at the speed at which it should, with the consensus with which it should. And honestly, <clears throat> any, even the best presidents have wins and losses. In, in the public eye. What Donald Trump sold was essentially what's called negative partisanship, right? There's more power in saying your opponent's bad than there is in spending money saying I'm good. But he did it against the culture of politics. He did it against Washington. He did it against elitism. And there are over 70 million people that would gladly say, yeah, I think Washington's broken. They're not looking out for us. They can't get anything done. I'm working hard 50 hours a week just to try to put my kids through school, maybe first generation, put my kids into college. And all I want to do is be left alone, but they're taxing me and they're making these terrible decisions with my money. They're running up debt. And I'm afraid that my kids won't have the opportunities I have. Boy, that's a powerful, damning message. But it doesn't offer any solutions, which is what we found in the last four to five years. And, and what is fascinating is how the nation went from that to kind of the steady hand of leadership of Joe Biden. And I, I think it's fascinating to see, and I, I will say this about Joe Biden's presidency thus far, I, I think from a, a purely objective standpoint, it's, it is a very mixed record, right? There are some early wins, but if you look at inflation, if you look at gas prices, if you look at Afghanistan, the border control, the border situation is worse than it's ever been. Now, he's yep. changed policies on families and children, but truly it's worse than it's ever been. But he has a long license <clears throat> to try to fix things, and he should because he inherited something that was so broken. But at the end of the day, I think more Americans today would say, I think Joe Biden's a decent guy who's trying to do the right thing, and he's not lying to us. And so we trust that, and we trust that kind of steady hand 
to, to take us in the direction and to see where it goes. Now that runway doesn't last forever, right? Republicans are gonna try to shorten that runway. <clears throat> but I think enough of it, as you mentioned, why did 70 million plus choose to elevate Trump? Because he sold angry populism. But more people chose a different direction. And I think that's the story of America in this moment. Helen Kelly has a question. Okay, go for yeah. it. David, wonderful talk. David, why aren't you a Democrat, number <laughs> one? And number two, can you give me a very good explanation of why we are not socialist and or that that seems to be such a big issue for Republicans yeah. that the Democrats are socialists, and I guess we're going to become another Russia. I don't. Yeah. <laughs> I, I just. So, can you, <laughs> is that too too long an answer for? No, no. Okay. And, and and let me. Um, I want you to I want you to listen for something from Republicans as you enter campaign season. If they cannot tag a candidate like Joe Biden as being socialist, they say this. It's the party of socialism, right? If they can't defend the, the attack that a candidate is socialist, they say the party of socialism. <clears throat> and then they go, <clears throat> excuse me, they refer to the squad and people who have actually embraced uh, a stronger hand of government. But I would say there's two reasons uh, Republicans use the attack. First is pure ignorance of history and economics. The use of the term socialism is an absolutely assertive attack that reflects an ignorance of today's Republican Party. But the second is that it reflects polling. It was two cycles ago when Republicans were polling. And interestingly, in the previous three cycles, all they had to do was tie a Democratic candidate to Nancy Pelosi. Many of you will remember those years. Every Democrat that ran, Republicans labeled them a Pelosi Democrat. And that resonated with Republican performing voters. They didn't like Nancy Pelosi. And that was the attack. Well, that attack started to wane and they needed another one. And they went out and poll tested. This is, this is living history. I'm giving you the secrets of the Republican playbook. They went out and they polled to find what would be a greater attack than labeling a Democrat a Pelosi candidate. And they arrived at the term socialism and they started using it. And I remember they used it in the Sarasota, uh, one of the Sarasota races. And I called up a longtime political consultant friend of mine and I said, is this really working? And he said, you won't believe it. it attacking Democrats as socialists resonates greater than any, any label we've had in the last 10 years. So it's an ignorant attack on behalf of Republicans, but it's an effective one. And so I think you need, you know, as I mentioned earlier, Nikki Fried came out of the gate saying, I'm a capitalist. And at some point, look, you're never going to be able to unpack the Republican charges, but you can convince enough voters that, they're, that their charges are wrong and are in error. Now, why am I not a Democrat? Uh, the truth is I perform as a Democrat in today's two-party system, uh, in my behavior, in my voting, and so forth. For those of you who have been a part of politics for a long time, I, I would just offer this as an answer, as an answer, not an explanation, not a suggestion. I knew leaving the Republican Party, my, my wife and I actually made the decision independently, but at the same time, I, my journey away from the Republican Party started very early. I was kind of a Bush 41 Republican. I remember when Bush 41 broke from the NRA in 94 or so. Um, that's where my heart was. I, I've never been a member, never been associated, but that was where I started a fracture from the Republican establishment as well. <clears throat> then the Tea Party emerges, wants to shut down the government. I really didn't have room in that Republican Party. I wasn't planning on running for Congress. I end up, I get into the race polling at 2% and the margin of error was four. <laughs> so do the math. Um, but I end up being a member of Congress in today's Republican Party. But I, I over the three years I was there, speak out in favor of of climate science, of marriage equality, uh, of immigration reform, of gun reform, all these issues that leave me, and, and against Donald Trump, publicly on the floor of the House, it leaves me for dead in the Republican Party. It was not until we were pregnant with our first kid and my wife said, do you really wanna bring her into the world and justify being a Republican in this moment? And, and that's what motivated me to leave. So I felt the relief of leaving the party, but here's the point. I didn't expect to feel the relief of being untethered 
from partisanship altogether. True political independence. And I love it. I love everything about it. <clears throat> I, if you look around the world, the United States is an outlier in having only two parties, two major parties. Most leading democracies are multi-party democracies. They have four, five, six parties. All of the data suggests you have greater consensus in governing, you have more voter satisfaction, <clears throat> greater diversity of representation. Multi-party democracies perform better. The rules are set against a multi-party democracy in the United States. So we're not, we're not there yet. So that leaves an independent, like 35% of the state of Florida pushing on 40 to choose to perform as a Democrat or a Republican when it comes to their political behavior. I choose to perform as a Democrat in today's political environment. <clears throat> hey, David, it's Chris. I'm, I'm going to just take over here just for a brief second. I appreciate what you just said about being an independent. That, that resonates with an awful lot of people. What do you do in primary season, David? Do you, do you pick a team, <laughs> register, and then go back? No, I advocate for open primaries. No, I don't do the, the pick a team and go back. Look, I... I, I, I think that, look, Ed, very quickly, our, our electoral system today disenfranchises people through closed primaries, through gerrymandered districts, and through big money that has been blessed and tied to the two major parties. I'm actually working in full disclosure with a group called the Serve America Movement. We operate as the SAM party in some states. We have run unity tickets for governor and lieutenant governor, a Democrat and a Republican, or a Republican and a Democrat. But we're not naive in the challenge of, of mounting a viable third party. We choose jurisdictions very carefully. We will, this cycle, elect two mayors in the state of Connecticut. The mayor of Newtown will be a Sam Party candidate uh, who will be elected. He's been endorsed actually by the Democrats and unopposed by the Republicans. So I spend my political energy actually trying to support viable independent candidates. And I wish we had an open primary system. I think what Alaska's done is fascinating. Pure open primary where the top four, uh, ranked choice voting in a primary, the top four move to the general election and there's ranked choice voting among those top four. I think any of those reforms will help improve and help greater enfranchise voters like myself who are now out of the process. Thanks, Dave. I'm going to register your daughter in 16 years as a Democrat. <laughs> <laughs> she might listen. I got to tell you, I, I tell my mom, you know, I don't know if this young lady is 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 brilliant or going to have a career in politics or music or whatever. But I've said in two years that we know she's on the right side of the curve here. We just got to point her in the direction and let her go. She's a she's a take charge girl. So she'd be a take charge Democrat if you recruit her. <laughs> Thank you, David. Uh, Rick, can you unmute Larry Berman, please? And, uh, and I think uh, a, a lot of the answers that you uh, uh, gave to these questions were, were very good. Um, you're, you're really good on your feet. Uh, as, a, uh, as a Democrat, I believe in regulated, uh, fettered, if you will, uh, capitalism. Uh, the, 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 the white national terrorist party, the AKA Republicans call it the, uh, uh, call it socialism. My question to you is I'm trying to understand why, uh, you were a Republican at one time, uh, outside of being, uh, you know, outside of supporting, uh, bogus economic policies and, and, advocating these astronomical uh, budgets for uh, defense spending, why did you become a Republican? <laughs> See, now that's a good way to frame a question if you're, if you're a Democrat. <laughs> Look, I, I would disagree obviously a little bit with how you describe um, um, some of the Republican policies, at least those that, of the party that I joined. I, I do fundamentally believe, um, and, and we've got to make this a dispassionate conversation for a second. I believe countries are stronger where the private sector and individual choice is the greatest. 
right? I, I think the long-term prognosis of economies where the state has increasing control over taxes and spending ultimately compromise the long-term growth of that society. That's an, that's an economic principle, right? The problem is for modern Republicanism, they've just ripped the Band-Aid off and they've gone from you know, less government to no government to, as you mentioned, kind of unfettered, unregulated uh, economies. And that can't happen. If you look at the, the mortgage meltdown and the financial meltdowns, it is because of extreme deregulation that permitted uh, people who controlled huge sectors of our economy to gamble, to essentially go to Vegas. And everything was great until they lost. And then we all suffered the consequences of it. So there is a role for government. And I think that voice is no longer in the Republican Party. It was when I joined. I, when I joined in 19, I don't know, 88, maybe, there was still conversation around that. The basic principles of investing and growing the private sector and more human freedom or, or personal freedom, personal choice were still the underlying tenets, but it just got way, way, way out of control. And the pandemic is a perfect example. The, the state, with a small s, exists to protect the collective interest of its citizenry. And in a moment of public health crisis, it is only the state that can intervene to protect the public health of the citizenry. That is also a principle, just as much as I, I mentioned believing in private sector growth. It is a principle that the state exists to protect the collective security of the people, the citizenry, against foreign attacks or domestic attacks. That is why we have a national defense system, because the states couldn't do it by themselves. Human freedom doesn't accomplish that. We have to resign over certain decision makings to the collective interests of the citizenry and then empower the state to deploy resources in that interest. So those are conversations that do not happen in today's Republican Party. The pandemic and Ron DeSantis's leadership being example number one. Screw public health. This is about personal freedom. There's no role for government. That's wrong. It's irresponsible. It's dangerous. And it's killing people in the Sunshine State. Okay, thank you, David. We appreciate your time with us today. And All right. We, we hope to have you back again. Hope we'll hey, up for that. I would love to do that post pandemic. I'll be there in person. I I do thank you for the invitation. I really do. Um, I appreciate having conversations like this around the state. And I thank you for accommodating this virtually and understanding it's in the public health interest as well as our personal family health interest. So thank you all very much for being here this morning. Thank you for the invitation. Very good. Thank you, David. We appreciate it.